I need my community. I need you all in order to be what God wants me to be, to do what God wants me to do. I need you all in my life. I need you to help me raise my children. I need you to help me be a good husband. I need you to help me preach the gospel. I need you to help me study the scriptures. I need you to help me make decisions in my life. I need you to help me through hard times. And because I need you, I want to be there for you. I want to be those things for my community. Well, I've been, I've been speaking through um, this Followers the Way 101 series on the distinctive ideas that brought us together in Boston. And I'm going to continue that. I think this is the third one in our series. We did the Gospel, and then we did um, Sermon on the Mount Obedience. And today I want to talk about um, community. I've, I've talked a lot about community since we've been here in the last 10 years. Um, it was a central idea for, for why we came together when Finney and I made plans to come here um, we spent a lot of time talking about the value and the importance of community. It's been an important part of my Christian experience for, for quite some time. Um, so I want to just start at the beginning. Some of this you may have heard from me before, but I think we'll, we'll go there again anyhow. Um, the word community is... is there's a, a set of words around them, and they all come from this idea of common union. Communion is the common union, and a community is a common unity. Like, it's what brings people together and makes them one thing. And, you know, there, I don't hear it quite as much <laughs> nowadays, but five years ago in pop Christianity, there was a lot of talk about community. I know it still happens but the word community means different things to different people. And I'm not critical of that. It's okay. I use the word community in different contexts for different people. So, so my community is the people that I live with that are close to me, that, are, that we live in a, in a close geographical proximity. But this is also my community, the people that I commune with. And my community is also the neighborhood that I live over by the train in Malden. That's a community. And and the Boston area is a community. So the word community can get bigger and bigger. And the bigger it gets, the less it means, right? Like there's a community of America. There's a community of Western civilization. But the farther out the community gets, the less it implies about who we are that are in it. There's more uh, of a range of experience the broader the community becomes. The reason, the reason I, so I have a list of things that I want to cover in this Followers Way 101 series. And I'm trying to do them in some semblance of order. And the reason that I picked to talk about community today is because I think that community is a direct outflow from our ideas about the gospel and what it means to be God's people. And what I mean by that is that there's, when we, you know, when we talked about the gospel, we made the claims that the gospel at its, at its core element is the proclamation of Jesus as God's king over the nation of God. And that these real political implications have a lot to do with what the gospel invitation is. And, and if we begin our, if we begin defining our terms about the gospel as the nation of God, there's a couple of major implications that follow. One is that Jesus as a king makes his law and his domain and his rule. That's all implicit. I, I was on the phone. We had a call yesterday, some of us, and Yash was on that call. And we were talking about, about um, this, some of these kingdom principles and the, the gospel of the kingdom. And and his testimony on that call yesterday, I hope he doesn't mind that I quote him, but he said, when I first came around Followers of the Way, I was wrestling with all of these one-off issues, like 
how do I feel about non-resistance? And how do I feel about head covering? And how do I feel about this? And how do I feel about the other thing? And each of those was something that he felt like he had to kind of wrestle through as an idea in and of itself. And he said, in retrospect, it would have been so much more healthy for me to start just with Jesus as the king of his people and the kingdom of God. And then it implies so much about my need to follow him and do what he says. Like, I'm not trying to decide about what I think about an idea. If my initial if my initial entry into the kingdom of God is Jesus is my king, I'm going to do what he says, I'm going to go where he says, I'm going to be like he says, then when all, all I have to be convinced of is that this is what Jesus says. And then I can say, okay, well, story's over. Like, that's it. That's, that's what I'm supposed to do. So those implications are really important. I think it's why it's worth arguing about what the gospel actually is and why it matters. So these implicit ideas that Jesus is, is the king and he has a right to tell us what to do and how to be, that's one major implication. But the second major implication of the gospel of, of the kingdom is that it de-individualizes the premise of the gospel. What I mean by that is that I am not at the center of the gospel. You are not at the center of the gospel. Who is at the center of the gospel of the kingdom? Jesus is at the center of the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel is about him. It's not about me. And that is an incredibly important idea as well. Along with that idea that the gospel is about him as the king, establishing his nation on earth in every kindred, tribe, and tongue, is that I am joining myself to something. That's an important implication of the gospel of the kingdom, is that it's not about me going to heaven, it's about me becoming a part of the nation of God. And the language of the New Testament is so full of this, especially in Paul, when he talks about being aliens, and when he talks about being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, when he talks about we who were strangers, like these ideas of adoption and coming in are into the nation of God. We were outside of that people and that group, and we have come into identification with that people and that group under Jesus. All of that, that that's the root premise for community. I am not a self-existing Christian. I am a disciple who chose to join the nation of God. I'm not the nation of God. I'm not Israel. I'm a part of the nation of God. It's not about me. It's me joining something that's about him. And that, you know, that obviously begs the question, what are you joining? What does it mean to be a part of the nation of God? What are the implications of that on your life and, and how you're living and where you're living and what you're doing? What does it mean for you and I to be a part of the people of God? Well, that, when I ask that question, it makes me think, well, what did it mean to be a part of Israel? What, were the, what defined who was in Israel? There's some very specific texts that talk about what, who de, what was defining Israel. But I, I kind of thought in a bigger sense, like what, what, what did it mean to be a Hebrew in the Old Testament? So there's certainly, uh, there's certainly a presumption. There's some, certainly some idea of we're under one government, right? Like, if I'm, an, if I'm an Old Testament Hebrew, we're sharing a nation-state identity. We have a common government. We're either under, under the judges, that was one, we're under Moses, we're under Joshua, we're under the judges, we're under the kings. There's a common government that's happening for everyone who's in Israel. They're all subject to it. There's a common sacramental system of, of temple worship and sacrifice, there's a common defense, like we know what's our territory and what's not, and we're in, you know, we're in a struggle to continue to exist as a particular people. There's common worldviews involved. One of the root identities of Israel is that they saw themselves, all of them saw themselves, as God's special people together. That's what it means to be a part of Israel, that you know, all of the conversation that God has about Israel, about choosing them as a particular people, as 
his chosen people, like you're my special group of people. I have something particular to do with you that I don't have to do with others. So this notion of being God's special people together and heirs of his promises, like together we're inheritors of the promises of God. A part of the identity of Israel was to have rights and prerogatives towards one another. You know, there was one law for how you dealt with the Gentiles, and there was a different law for how you dealt with, with your fellow people in Israel. Those distinctions were made, that there were special rights and prerogatives. There's a, an accountability to priestly and prophetic orders, a need to come under the influence of the priests and the prophets that God had set up for his people. That was a part of their identity. And, and there were these very special moments, and these are things that, that I think explicitly defined Israel, two in particular, circumcision and the Passover. You know, of course, that the Passover was a defining moment, not just the original Passover, but participation in the ongoing Passover was literally a definition of who was in Israel. In other words, if you didn't keep the Passover, you were not a part of Israel. So much so that for those that were unclean, there's a do-over day. Like, hey, Passover came and I couldn't be there because I was unclean. There's a do-over Passover because everybody in Israel has to keep the Passover. And these are very, very specific identity issues, circumcision and Passover, that define, at least in part, define who Israel is. In light of all that, of everything that I've just gone over, of government, of the temple, of these common identities, of being God's chosen people, of accountability to the priests and the prophets, of circumcision and Passover. Ask yourself this question with me. What would it mean to be a Hebrew under all of that all by yourself? Does it, is, is there anything meaningful about being a Hebrew outside of all of that? Like, imagine you just whisk up your average Hebrew in the, in, in the time of Isaiah, and you take him and you move him to the other side of the world. I'm not saying he doesn't have any identity, but how does he meaningfully be a Hebrew outside the context of all of those things that define the nation of Israel? It's unpracticable. How do you keep the Passover by yourself? How do you go to the temple when, you're not at the te when you can't have access to the temple? How do you partake in the prophetic and the priestly orders if you're not in Israel? How do you do any of that outside of Israel? It all implies a community. Everything that it meant to be a Hebrew meant to be a Hebrew together in the nation of Israel. It's about the land and the space. That's kind of the whole point to the Old Testament stories is that it's about this land and this space where we're all together doing this thing. Functionally, it's meaningless outside of the community. Well, how does that apply to how we think of the New Testament? I want to look, and you can open with your Bibles with me if you want, to Acts chapter 2. And we'll look at a few things here. In the very beginning, you know, it's funny, the, the, sometimes it's the smallest expressions that mean the most to me when I, read, when I read the Bible. And right here in the beginning of Acts chapter 2 is one of them. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. I mean, that's a functional definition of community. All in one place in one accord. That's a beautiful, beautiful definition of community. <clears throat> So we start this chapter, they're all in one accord, in one place, and suddenly there come, came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So... We all know this is like the, the Pentecostal moment when the Holy Spirit comes upon the church. Uh, some people, you know, it's, it's right to consider this the, the, the birth of the church, the inauguration of the church. This is, this is a, 
a, a really prominent occasion for the first of our people. And then they, they speak in tongues. They have this experience out in public with everybody wondering. They're all amazed and in doubt in, in verse 12, saying one to another, what meaneth this? And then, then um, Peter has his sermon. And let's go down to verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's beautiful, but what I want to call attention to is, for the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I feel like sometimes people think I'm making mountains out of molehills when I talk about the communitarian aspects and the de-individualization of the gospel of the kingdom. But right here, in one of the most pivotal moments for the birth of the church, one of the most dynamic sermons that's given under the unction of the Holy Spirit, the promise itself, what all of this is connected to, is a communal experience. It's for you It's for your children. It's for all who are far off and for everyone who is called. It is not, when I say it's not about you, it's about us. This is a common experience in Christ that we have. And so many things flow from this idea, right? So much of what, it becomes a paradigm with which you read the New Testament. When you begin to see, because and maybe it's particularly stark for me because I grew up in, in, in an evangelical setting where every time the gospel was talked about, it was about me going to heaven. You have a date that you ask Jesus into your heart so that when you die, you go to heaven. That's everything that I heard about the gospel for all my formative years. And now, after my experiences with Christ, I come back to the scriptures and I see it's not about me. It's, a, it's about Jesus first, and it's about us together, his people. My appeal is that community is implicit in the gospel. To be Christian is to be a part of the community of God. It doesn't make sense otherwise. And even the promise itself in Peter's mouth is not just for me. It's not an individualized promise. It's for us. Our Father, who's our? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I don't even approach him in the Lord's Prayer individualistically. I come as a representative of my people. Our Father. Not my Father, our Father. There's we implicit in all of these things. And the, and the end of this chapter, after we have the promise for all of us, with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. And then in such a beautiful, beautiful example, this all becomes real. It's not just words that Peter's sharing. It's not just words. They don't just ask Jesus into their heart. There's an immediate effect from all of this promise being engaged in. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And so what happens when that happens? When the Holy Ghost makes a promise and people follow through and they're baptized and made new, (coughs) then these are the effects. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And they and all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord. How often? They continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. When I was first um, wrestling with ideas about community, uh, 
I, uh, so I've been interested in Christian communitarianism for probably 15, well, I've been here 10 years now, probably close to 20 years. And, um, and in that time, as I've wrestled with, with the ideas associated with community, what's God trying to do with us? What's God trying to show us? How's he trying to organize us? I've encountered a lot of like, um, I've encountered a lot of people who are like me, who, who, who want the same things. I've encountered resistance. I've encountered people who, who, who don't like, who are pushing away from these ideas. You know, one of the ideas that, that, that gets used to dismiss this is that this is the response to persecution. There's no persecution in Acts chapter 2. There's no organized persecution right here. The apostles start to suffer some persecution after this, but even then, like what is it, chapter 5, when Gamaliel says, if this is from God, as a representative of the Sanhedrin, we can't fight against this. If it's from man, it'll fall apart. If it's from God, we can't fight against it. That's, that's a couple chapters down the road from this story. We are not in an era of sustained persecution. I'm not saying things weren't tense. Jesus has been, just been crucified. But these people, are, like their, their commitment to each other, their commitment to drawing near one another is not the response of how do we continue to exist in a persecuted environment. This is the response to God's changed my life and made me different. And these are the responses that come out of me when God affects me. When God changes me, when I become a part of his people, my relationship to everything around me changes. My relationship to my family changes. My relationship to my nation changes. My relationship to my possessions changes. Everything takes a new dynamic when I become baptized into Jesus' name. And one of those responses is that we, we, we reorient ourselves in a world that is all about myself and my things. And that's, that's why I, I feel so passionately about the ideas of Christian community because it is the response of, of me becoming new in Christ and reorganizing myself in a world that's built out of self and possession. It's the tangible effects of the gospel. How far have we come as a people from, from this origin? Where the church is born in Jerusalem, where the immediate impulse of people who are baptized is to cooperate and coordinate and change the relationship to the society around them and to create this new collective community, how far have we come from these ideals? As a people, as, as modern Christians, is it implicit when someone is baptized now in our day, in our churches, where we've come from? Is it implicit that when somebody goes through the waters of baptism, they're going to reorient their life in relation to their stuff and their place? What, is, it the, is it the heart of people who are newly baptized to want to be in one place with one accord, with things in common? And if that's not the common experience, if that's not what we see over and over again happening, what's preventing that? Why is that not the impulse like it was here in Jerusalem? What's getting in the way of that desire, of that response? <clears throat> I think there's, there's several things that, that pull us apart. So what I see, like what I think of graphically is that Pentecost happens and everybody comes together. The church becomes this new epicenter. It becomes an economic center. It becomes a social center. It becomes a religious center. It becomes like the church becomes this like living, breathing organism. 
And when I look around me in the world and the people that I've known over the years in the church and the churches that I've seen and experienced, everybody feels pulled apart into their own world, into their own job, into their own life, into their own family, into their own things. And so I, like a lot of people interested in community before me, have to ask ourselves, like, what, wh wh why is that? What's getting in the way of us being like the church in Jerusalem? I think one thing is, is, is too much of the cares of this life. It's easy to get consumed with and to be so occupied with what's happening in the world around us, to get so occupied in our our self-maintenance, to get so occupied in the cares that we can just perpetuate endlessly, that we lose sight of the more important things. It's a priority structure. It's a priority scheme. The other things become more important to me. There's, I, th I think that there's, um, I haven't lived for a long time in other parts of the world but I'm suspicious that it's particularly American, this desire to have these little autonomous, independent enclaves. I mean, how can it not... The charter document of this nation is the Declaration of Independence. And I can't imagine, like, all of the other ways that that, that is the zeitgeist of American culture. The Western expansion... All, all the things that are American are about autonomy and independence. I think it's still to this day why Americans are so strange and peculiar as compared to Europeans, Western Europeans, who, who don't think like Americans. We don't think like Europeans, and Europeans don't think like Americans. The same, a lot of the same cultural roots and ties in Western civilization, but there's a, a stark difference between the way that Americans perceive things and the way that Europeans perceive things. And, and here, in, in our culture, there's so many things like at the root of who we are that drive us towards independence, that we want to be on our own, we want to be self-sufficient. The ideals and virtues of our people, our culture that we're all born into, all put at the highest level these ideas of autonomy, individuality, and, and at its core, no, what it's, at the core of all of those, and we shouldn't expect any different from a country founded in rebellion, is nobody's going to tell me what to do. I mean, the most American expression I can think of is, if you're not hurting anybody, it's, none, it's no one's business. Like, that's the American ideal expressed in a sentence. As long as you're within your own personal bubble, it's nobody's business what you do. And our cultural pursuits, our religious pursuits, our economic pursuits, our social pursuits all fall into that. So often, I want to say all, but so often they fall into that domain. What? exerts autonomy, what creates independence, what, what can show the world that nobody has any control over me, what can show the world, what, how can I demonstrate and make it clear that I am my own man. Nobody has strings on me, nobody controls me, nobody tells me what to do, I don't have obligations to anybody. I know that's a little bit hyperbolic, but but if you look at our culture and what we value and how we function, these king of my castle attitudes are so implicit in who we are and how we're raised. The, the idea of openness and exposure and involvement and interdependence is almost frightening from the American cultural perspective. It's the opposite of what we want. It's the opposite of what we're raised to embrace. So, so when we, as Americans, <clears throat> interact with the church, we've developed, I think, 
socially and culturally, we've developed this attitude of like, the church is something that I go to for a religious experience, and then I go back to my own life. I go on Sunday or Wednesday, I go out to church, I have some kind of religious experience, maybe it's good, maybe it's blah, whatever, but I go to church, and then I go back to the rest of my life. It's like going to the grocery store, right? Like, I have a need, I go over here, I interact in almost like a, a, a commercial kind of way. There's some transaction that happens, I pay my tithe, I hear a sermon, I get some feedback or some teaching or something, and then I go back to my life. And this is where most of my world is. And then I step out of my world and I go over here for a minute and I interact with the church and then I go back to my world. How, how do you interact with... How, okay. Let's play out a scenario. I, I'm at home. The house is a mess. The children are crying. Things aren't going well, whatever. There's dishes in the sink. Got to do stuff. I've been in pajamas. So now I got to go somewhere and meet with somebody. So what do I do? Okay, well, I got to hurry. I got to go get some clothes on. I got to get dressed. I got to clean up. I do whatever I do. I go out of my, my world and I, I put on like nice clothes. I brush my teeth. I'm presentable. I'm polite. I'm civil. I'm kind. I interact with the world. I go to the grocery store. I have a meeting. I do my business. And then I come back. And now I can be real again. Now life is rough and difficult and things don't always go well and Sometimes they go well, sometimes they don't, but this is real life. And then I put on my social costume and I go out in the world and I do my work and I do my shopping and I do my interactions with the world. And then I come back to my real world where maybe I yell at my children or maybe I'm a tyrant or maybe I'm lazy or maybe I'm whatever I am, but that stays in here in this lane. And then when I go out into the world, then I have a different way of presenting myself. I'm polished, and I'm the way I'm supposed to be, and I'm, there's social s expectations on my behavior, and I, I play that game. Well, when your view of the church is that you go out like you're going shopping, well, then you put that same thing on that you go on. Like, you don't go shopping in hold-up pajamas. You put on some clothes. You don't go to work in a dirty stained t-shirt, you, you present, you make yourself presentable. And if your interaction with the church is like your interaction with the grocery store, you make yourself presentable, you go to church. I don't know how many times, and I don't, I'm not being critical of my parents, but I don't know how many times growing up going to church, you have to be there in the morning and you, my parents have four children and they're all, they don't know where their shoes are and they don't have their hair combed and everybody's yelling at each other and it's a scream fest to get your stuff and get out the door. Would you go? going, where are your shoes, why aren't you doing, everybody's screaming at everybody, and then we all get in the car, and we go to church, and we fold our hands, and we, we're at church, and we say hello, and we do all of our civil posturing, and we're presentable, and we're a good Christian family, and then we go home, and we're kicking off our shoes, and we're fighting with each other, and all this stuff happens, that's how it is, that's how most people experience their church life. And I don't want it. That's why this is worth putting in a follower's way, core ideas. I don't want that. Very specifically, I do not want that. I want the church to come into my home. I want my home to come into the church. I want to bring these two worlds together. I want my life, my family, my home, and my church to all be in the same lane. I don't want to have to put on a special form of myself to be with you. I want to come here and I want you to know, why do I, why can I do that in the commercial world? Why can I be myself at home, but not when I go to work, or not when I go to store, or not when I go to a meeting, or not when I go, why can I be myself at home, and what does that mean to be myself? To be unguarded? To be real? 
to be who I actually am, to not pretend, to not have to put on airs. Well, we can do that with the church. We can be, this can be like home. Our interactions can be a part of our home life. This is why we're called brothers and sisters. I'm jumping ahead of my notes, but like, look, the first terms that they call each other is brother and sister. The Romans are upset by it. It's so familial in the new Christian church that the Romans think they're, they're incestuous. Because people, people called brother and sister are married to each other. Reality and honesty are at the heart of community. My first ideas that attracted me towards community had to do with, um, with economics. Because I saw Jesus talking so much about money and possessions, and I saw these things in Acts that my first impulses towards community had to do with economics. And I realized that was less and less, I, I mean, I, I don't want to downplay that. I think economics are important. I think the way that we think about our possessions is important. I think the way that we share is important. I think the way that we care for each other is important. I think the way that we, all that stuff is important. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm saying I think there's a deeper level to discuss community that has to do with reality and honesty. Like that's the, that's the center of community. The center of community is, is creating in a bigger circle what we all intuitively do at our home. The way that you're really yourself in your home, in the, in the, in the walls of your own domicile, that's what community is. And, and there's something incredibly empowering when you can expand those walls and have a people bigger than your children and your spouse that really know who you are, that really understand you. Every time I talk about community, I say this, and I think I probably always will, I thought the biggest hindrance to community, to setting up effective community where we're actually real with each other. When I was young, I thought the biggest problem with establishing communities, when I started thinking about this, the, what gets in the way? What's going to prevent this? How do we create a, a place where we can all really be real with each other? And when I, used to, when I used to think about that, the thing that would come to my mind is people being phony people being hypocrites, people presenting themselves as one way but being something entirely different when they were away from the church. And that does happen. I have seen that happen over the years sometimes, but it's rather infrequent. What I have come to realize is that the biggest problem, the biggest hindrance, say you buy what I've already said about the gospel and community and its, its roots, what prevents those of us that accept that premise from experiencing what God actually wants us to experience in community is not hypocrisy. It's not that I show up when I'm with you and I'm a complete fabrication. I'm never this way except for when I'm with you. I, I think that happens, but it's rather infrequent. It's rather rare because it's a very, very taxing way to try to live. Most people don't have the four... Uh, it requires so much to live so disingenuous. It requires a lot of work to be completely fake and phony. Most people don't have it in them to do that. But what I do have a very high capacity for is when I come around you, it's not that I'm a fake me. It's not that I'm a totally different person than I actually am. But the, but the real propensity is that I'm the best version of myself with you. And getting past being the best version of myself with you and being who I actually am day to day with all of my faults and my weaknesses and my struggles and my, and my weird proclivities of my personality and, and the things that make me not attractive, allowing those parts of myself to be known by you, my people, that's what's really hard. 
And that's why we, we have very specifically, like the Lord has started the ball for us, but as we've come together, we very specifically prioritized a time when we can be real with each other, when we can talk about what's really going on in our lives, where we can model before each other that this is the place where we talk about who we really are. And that, that's why the agape is one of the centerpieces of our community. It's the place and the time where everyone expects that we are going to really talk about who we are. Where it's okay for me to share what hurts and what's hard and what's not working well and where I fail and what I'm not good at and what I'm trying to learn. And I, and I after week after week of that, this is the, one of the cumulative effects of community that you don't realize until you try to walk through it, is that week after week after week of displaying and modeling and practicing that vulnerability and that reality creates a whole new sense of family and identity. Like, I don't have to hide from you. And that is one of the most empowering things, I think, for any people, for any person, is to have a group of people that you don't have to have any pretense with. You know who I am. For better and worse, you know who I am. Not, not the curated me, not the polished me, not the, not the me on his best behavior, not the me that, that talks to my clients, not the me that's trying to make money, not the me that's the real me, the me my family knows, the me that God knows, the me that I know and sometimes struggle with. If you can find a place where the real you is known and loved, that's community. N notice, though, I said the real, no the real me is known and loved, not accepted and loved, because... I don't want you to accept the broken parts of me. I want you to know them, and I want you to help me with them. I don't want you to accept them. I want you to help me fix them. And this is something that's so sublime and elegant and beautiful about Christian community, is that when, I can, when it's safe for me to be known, then I can get help in the places where I need help. How are you going to get help? to fix the parts of you that are broken if nobody knows they're there. Like, obviously, you can't fix it. You're you. Like, you're stuck with that. You have parts of you that are broken and that need help and need ministry. You can't, you, up to this point in your life, you have those things that are broken. You haven't figured out how to fix them yet. How, how do you think just doing that for longer is going to fix anything? You need somebody else. You need somebody else that it's safe and okay for you to be known by that can look with you and from a loving place as a brother, as a sister, say, I want to help you. I can help you with that. I, I see that. I see that in you. I still love you. I see it in you. Let's work on it. You don't have to stay that way. And everybody grows. Everybody has the potential to grow in that environment. The real me needs to change and needs to grow. And that can only begin when I'm known. That's, I mean, I think for most part, that's that what I just described there, that's not the hard sell of community. I think most people that, are, that want to be serious about God, that sounds pretty inviting. That you can be known and accepted and loved, that you can grow with a group of people who can see you for what you are 
and lovingly come alongside you and help you be a better person, help you be a better disciple, help you be a better spouse, help you be a better parent, help you be a better child? Who doesn't want that? I mean, everybody would say that they want that. But if you want that, then you have to be that for other people. And if, you want, and if you're going to be that for other people, it means you have to care really well for the people who are around you. And this is where it gets real. This is where it gets hard and people bail out. Or people, defense postures go up, defense mechanisms go up, and the bombs go off and the fights ensue and people find a way to leave. gets too hot, too hard, too real. They think they want it, and then you experience it, and it hurts. And you pull the plug, and you bail out. But if, you, if, if I want that in my life, if I want to be known and loved, if I want to grow, and if I want to change, if I want to be better than who I currently am, I have to be that for you. It's like the reciprocity that happens in marriage. Like, if Erica and I devote all of our attention and energy to serving the other, everybody wins. And in the Christian community, when everybody is looking after the well-being of their brother and their sister, everybody it creates a net of protection for everybody. Think of it this way. I can be self-interested. I can be worried about Matthew. I can be worried about my stuff and my world and my life. And I got one person looking after all those things. Or the Christian exchange is, okay, Matthew, you can't put yourself first. You got to worry about Charlton and his family. And you got to worry about Finney and his family and Paul and his family and Mike and his family and David and his family. You gotta worry, you gotta take on all these concerns. Man, that's a lot to worry about. You all got problems. Lots of children, lots of stuff going on. And now I brought all of your mess into my life, and I make that a part of my priors and my priorities and my thoughts and my feelings. And I start bearing your burdens and I start carrying your loads and I start rejoicing where you rejoice and weeping where you weep. And 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 all this fills my life. And before you ever have time to look, you turn around and you say, well, but now, instead of just me looking after my own things, Charlton's looking after me, Finney's looking after me, Paul's looking after me, Micah's looking after me, David's looking after me. I have, I have 20 people who care for my life instead of one. And this is the beautiful... I'm sorry, I left you out, David. Skipped right over you, but you're in there too. Now we have a network of care and concern where we bear one another's burdens. And, and by letting go of my own life and my own care and my own concerns and putting them underneath other people around me, I find myself, we all are lifting each other up. That's what, that's what the call of community is. To think more on the things of others than your own. To make people's lives and their success and their well-being and their trials and struggles and growth more important than your own. Listen, I don't, I don't care how close you live to the church. I don't care how close you live to your brother. I don't care if you share one building with 100 people. I, I don't, that's not, that's not what's essential about community. What I care about if we're talking about community is how much are you invested of the good, in the good of others and not your own. If you want a functional analysis of how how thoroughly am I living in community? How 
much are you invested in the well-being of others before yourself? That's the measure of community. What occupies your time and your space and your mind and your resources and your, what occupies you? That's not rhetorical. I mean that as a real exercise for each of you. What, what, where are the investments in your life into the other people that are in your community? Paul writes about these things often in the epistles. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Because if you're going to engage in that, you're going to have hardships and you're going to have difficulties and you're going to brush against each other. And if you have family, you're going to have to learn how to forgive. John says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. He also says, Who, Whoso hath this world's goods and see his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion for him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? And we know that Jesus said in Matthew 25, The king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. How do you, how, how's Paul tell the church to have one mind and one heart and speak with one, with, speak in one accord? That's, an ins, that's a preposterous task. To try to get a group of diverse people with diverse experiences and diverse interests to have one heart and one mind and speak one thing? Unless, unless they're, they're doing that, unless they're putting other people in front of themselves, unless there's more of an investment in the community than in myself, that's an, it's, it's never happened. I had a, 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 a note to talk about brother and sister, but we already mentioned that. I, I just think it's, it, there's so many things, there's so many things about the way we talk about the Bible, there's so many things about how we use terminology that affects how we think and act. I, I, there's, you know, how you talk about grace and defining grace, whether grace is God's unmerited favor or something else. That makes huge theological implications. Whether you, you think that Jesus' first and middle name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, or if you understand that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed of God, that makes a huge theological difference. But you can become like callous to these words and they become Christianese and you can rattle off Jesus Christ without even thinking about what it means for him to be God's anointed. It's so easy to do. And it's, there's nowhere that's more prone to that kind of like mutation of like, it just waters down into nothing like the term brother and sister. And that's sad. And I, it, it's, a, it's a warning sign to me. It's a, it's a, it's a danger. Uh, it's something I'm so afraid of that when I call somebody brother, that, that becomes like a title like mister instead of a description of who they are in my life. That's, that's particularly... Uh, where uh, what I've seen in our circles and the people that I've run with for the last long while is that that's a real issue for the whole church broadly, but I don't struggle with it as much with men because I, I have interactions with men that are, you know, prayer meetings, brothers meetings, all these other things. But where it happens a lot is where the term sister for a man or brother for a woman becomes titular. It becomes just a title that we use. And I, I have... And you, you all know me, I try, to, I try to say sis to the women because it's, it's, 
informal, because it's, it's familial, because it's not a title. I'm trying to, in my own little funny way, I'm trying to say, when I say this to you, I mean I think of you like my sister. I'm not using a title. There's a thousand ways to do that, but it's important that we do them. It's important that when, when you men think about the women in this church, that you think of them like your sisters in the flesh, like you care for them and you worry about them and you want to, care, you want to make sure that their, their life is well, that they're taken care of, that they have what they need, that you feel a sense of, of obligation to protect and watch over and help. And gender lines get weird in, in, because we believe in propriety and modesty and, and keeping things holy. It's easy to kind of get too far and disassociate. And the women in the church are way over there. And I don't really know them. And I don't really, I'm not really invested in their lives because that's woman stuff. And the women will do that. And I'll stay here with the brothers. And that's not family. It's not healthy. It's not community. We can have our cake and eat it too. We can have propriety and modesty and we can be holy people and we can, we can believe all those things and keep those, pro- those lines where they should be and really care about each other and really have relationships and be meaningfully brothers and sisters with each other. And it's important that we do. I... I often think of this issue of community in terms of negation. What the opposite of what I want, the opposite of what I'm talking about, is when, when your church life is defined by this meeting. The public meetings that we have, if that was the definition of your church life, this is an utterly failed experiment. I don't, I'm not minimizing the value of this time together. I'm saying this is not the definition of my church life. This is not what my involvement with the church looks like, is this meeting right here. This is the tip of the iceberg. This is just a glimpse into, into what actually my church life is about. I call it Sunday, Wednesday church life, and I, I don't... That feels a little, I don't know, disrespectful. I don't mean by that that this meeting is not important. I don't mean that the way the church teaches and makes public proclamations and our times when we're formally meeting together are not important, but they're the least important because this isn't where I build relationships. This isn't where I do personal growth. This isn't where I interact with the church as a member of a family. And I don't want to define my life with the church by these public meetings. It would never do for this time right now, this hour and a half to be the definition of a, what, like when somebody asks you, are you a Christian? And you say, yeah, and this is what comes to mind. I'm a Christian because I go to that meeting, that public meeting that we have where somebody teaches for an hour. That's why I'm a Christian. To to the extent that church life is defined by these few meetings a week, that's the extent to which we are not in community. Let's talk about some of the practical outworkings and the logistics of this. I said before, and I meant it, that I don't care how close you live to the church. That's not the definition of community. The definition of community is how much you care for other people more than yourself. That's 100% true. I will also say that it's that proximity, being close to one another, makes all of that easier. The closer we are to each other, the easier it is to care well for one another. The easier it is to be responsive to one another. The easier it is to pray together and to have the non-sermon hour kind of church life that we all want. And so, and so we have always, and I hope that we always continue, to encourage people to make costly and difficult choices to be close to the church. 
you should make costly and difficult decisions to be as close to the church as you can. I've, I've, I've made those decisions. A lot of you in this room have made those decisions. You've made costly and difficult decisions to be close to the church, and I have never regretted one of those decisions in my life. It's never done me wrong to prioritize my closeness to the church over a lot of other things. And my life has been so rich and so deep and so blessed by my ability to live in and around the church of God. My family's impacted. My spiritual vitality is impacted. And this goes to... Uh, I, I don't mean to say by that that we can't, we can't have meaningful community if we don't live in, in multifamily houses together. What I do mean is that the further you are away, the harder it is. If you're a block away, two blocks away, five blocks away, half a mile away, a mile away, two miles away, ten miles away, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying you got to make that trip every time you're together. And I don't. When, I, when, when we have, you know, these community cl uh, clusters where we live in multifamily, where we live in the neighborhood together, where we live within <coughs> a short walk from each other, it's just not hard to get together. It's not hard to spend time together. It's not hard to, to meet each other's needs. It's not hard to, to get together because a child's sick and we need to pray. Or to, all of that flows easier the closer we get. And there's tons of benefit. And, and the, main, the main reason for, for as close as we can be is that accidental community is the most meaningful part of community. And what I mean by that is the things that you never planned, they were never on a calendar, there was never a WhatsApp that went out and said, hey, can we meet at this time? The, just the, the rubbing of our lives together, where we run into each other taking the trash cans out, or, hey, uh, we have some extra food, you guys want to come up for dinner, or we cross each other in the driveway and happen to have a really meaningful conversation about something that's going on in our lives. All of those accidental parts that that's where you really have family, right? Like, I don't plan my interactions with my wife and my children. We just live in the same house and stuff happens. And if you do that with the church, if you just live in the same place and stuff happens, that's the best stuff of life. It's really, really good. It's not always good. Let's be honest, right? Okay, we're going to talk about logistics. Some of it's hard. Some of it doesn't work well. Some of it's a problem. Some of it's why can't you... Would you get your child to quit leaving stuff in the driveway? That's a real part of community. But it's also a real good part of community, even though it's difficult in the moment. Just like the way you rub on each other in your own families. When your children rub on each other, when you and your spouse rub on each other. That the difficulty, if you learn to be righteous, if you learn to be holy, if you learn to use those things for the way that God wants to shape you, they become a part of the positive experience. How do I talk to my brother when I have a problem with his child? This, you know, there's tons and tons of people that never learn how to do that. Because they never need to. It's easier just to go your own way. I'd rather... I'd rather us rub against each other. I'd rather us have problems with our children and learn how to talk with them. I'd rather have annoyances because I don't like the way you do this or you don't like the way I do that. And learn how to interact with each other and care for each other and love one another in spite of that. Because I don't want our connection to be about everything's roses. If you get married because you think you're never going to have problems with your wife, you're not going to have a good marriage. It's not going to work well for you. So, we've tried to be careful, you know. I, we knew when we came here to Boston that urban community, and we'll have a whole message on that and its rationale, but that's, it's going to be difficult. If the church is going to make disciples, like this, let's just have a real conversation about this. If the church is going to make disciples, if the church is effective at preaching the gospel, we're going to convert and have new disciples who don't live in our 
in our little family clusters? How do we meaningfully engage with people? Like, I don't want a two-tiered way of viewing, like, well, you're not really important to the church because you don't live here in our family cluster. I don't want that. And we've, been, we've tried to be careful about our polity and the way that we talk about decisions as a church and the way that we, all, all that church dynamics, like we want everyone to have a voice, we want everybody to be equally committed, we want everybody to be involved, not the, the people who live in community, the people who don't. So, so it's not like we've set up a structure where you're not really a part of the church if you don't live right underneath somebody else in the church. That's one premise. The other premise is that the closer we can live together, the better community life is. And so what we found over the years is that if you keep those two things where they should be, if you keep both of those premises in place, you don't have to live in the house, in a multifamily house with somebody in the church to be a meaningful part of the church. And the closer you are to the church, the better community is. People see that effect. They see the consequence of accidental communion. They see how valuable it is. They, here's, here's where it happens. Every time you have, you have one of our community clusters and we're having a meeting or somebody came over for supper and now there's a party going on and everybody loves it and we're singing and we're praying and we're talking and everything's wonderful and somebody's looking at the clock and being like, oh, man, I gotta go home. I gotta take the children home. I gotta get my children home. And they have to pull themselves away from that and drive however long and go back to their house. And every time that happens, you just feel like it'd be way better if you were here. Like what? You could stay another 20 minutes. You could stay another 30 minutes. You could stay another 40 minutes if you just had to go downstairs or across the street. And you wouldn't have to pull yourself away. And those are the places that continue to sell the idea of community in, among us. Because it's valuable to be close to each other. Hebrews has two different passages that talk about that. In the, in the beginning of Hebrews in chapter 3, it says, exhort one another daily. When were they getting together in Acts? Daily. When does Hebrews say we should exhort one another? Daily. Well, it's called today. Lest any of you, listen to this, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. M- m- my access to you is protective for my heart being hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Why is that? Why is a daily exhortation from my brothers and sisters in the church protective? Because you see my life, you see my faults, you see what's happening with me, and you can help me get off of the path of destruction. You can say, hey, brother, I know that you know that I love you, right? This isn't going to go well for you. Let me help you with this. And it keeps my heart soft from the deceitfulness of sin because other people are watching and caring for me. That's the value of community. And Hebrews exhorts us to do that daily with each other. How are you doing that daily? Again, I'm not saying you have to live in a multifamily with people, but how are you doing that? And it also says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I need my community. I need you all in order to be what God wants me to be, to do what God wants me to do. I need you all in my life. I need you to help me raise my children. I need you to help me be a good husband. I need you to help me preach the gospel. I need you to help me study the scriptures. I need you to help me make decisions in my life. I need you to help me through hard times. And because I need you, I want to be there for you. I want to be those things for my community. I'd be, it would be remiss if I didn't end this conversation dealing honestly with Many, many people who write to me, call me, talk to me, leave comments on our material that say, that all sounds great, but what if I can't? 
I mean, that's nice for you guys. You got that set up in Boston, and you got some multifamilies where people live, and it sounds all very lovely, but I can't do that. I'm not at a place in my life. I don't have people around me. I don't have a faithful witness of the church. I don't have brothers and sisters. I'm all on my own, or I'm in a place where that isn't working, or whatever the case may be. There's a thousand a thousand examples of people who just don't have access to what we are very, very lucky to have. What about them? What if I can't? There's, I, I, I really only have two things to say. One is be faithful where you can. Be faithful where you can. I... When I talk about this, another thing that I often mention is that when these ideas were, were relatively new for me and I was really, really gung-ho about Christian community and I, was, I, was, I had a church and they were good brothers and sisters. We cared very much for each other, but everybody wasn't so on board with all the communitarian ideas that I was expressing. And I was frustrated. I was like, what's wrong with you people? Can't you see this right here? And I called a friend who was sympathetic to my ideas. He lived on the other part of the country. And I was complaining to him that these stiff-necked people in my church, they just didn't believe in community. They just didn't want it. They just didn't, they didn't, whatever, whatever, whatever. All my complaints. And his simple and wise answer was, Matthew, are you living in community as much as you can with the people that you're with? And it struck me to my heart. Because there were things. It didn't matter if everybody embraced my particular ideals about Christian community. There was plenty of room that I had in my life at that place where I could have been more invested in the good of others than myself. And I wasn't. And that's exactly what I needed to hear. And I try to repeat that advice to anybody who asks me, what do I do if I can't have community? My answer, my first answer is always, are you living in as much community as you can where you're at? Are you investing in the lives of people around you right now, today, tomorrow? Are you invested in other people's lives? That's the heart of community. And I don't, I don't believe that God wastes that. And I think that the, the, in large part, the reason that Eric and I have found ourselves into a place where we're in a community that's very rich and very deep and very meaningful to us is because over the years, we were faithful to that call to be in as much community as we could where we were, to try to minister to others and, and care for others. No matter what our agreements or disagreements were, I want to care well for the people that I'm connected to and close to, and that's what builds community. Secondly, my second piece of advice after that is move your life when you can and how you can in the direction of, of community. Move towards community. Make what sacrifices and decisions you can to, to move your life towards more of the ideal of community that you want. And those are the only two real pieces of advice I have. So I, I pray in, all, in regards to all this that God would, would help us live out our de ideals, that they wouldn't be... Here's a warning for, for us. I have been in community settings where, where we believe in community, where we're living in community, and we're not caring well for each other where we live very close to one another geographically, like I can throw a stone through my neighbor's window and he's my brother in the church, and sometimes I want to throw a stone through his window. And that, it's, it's, it's easy to look at your life and say, I've made costly decisions and I live in community and so I'm doing it right. I live in community. And so I'm, I'm fulfilling what God's asking me of these things without doing the real work of evaluating how well, how, how good am I being at caring for the people that I'm in community with? 
where are the costs in my life that I'm paying to care for others? Where are the burdens that I'm bearing that I wouldn't have to if I didn't choose to? Those are the important things that we need to continue to evaluate. And don't, let's not just think that because, because we live within blocks of each other's homes and, and we can see each other very easily that we've met the high calling of being an, like they were in Acts, where we're really caring for one another and meeting each other's needs. I want the whole package. I want the real deal for us. Let's pray together. And then David, I'll have you come. Heavenly Father, thank you for our community. Thank you for the trials and difficulties that community life have brought to some of us and for the blessings and the grace that community has brought for us. I thank you for the men and women that I've had the privilege to live in and among. I thank you for my own place in the family of God. I thank you that I have brothers and sisters in Christ. I thank you for all of the rich things that I experience because of what you've made for us. I pray that you would continue to build your church, not just in Boston, but in in places all over the country and the world where people can experience the family of God, where people can be who they really are, where they can be known and loved and they can grow and change. I ask for your grace, Father, among us, that we would learn to love one another well, where we would continue to make decisions to think more on the, thoughts of, uh, on the things of others than our own. We ask for your blessing on our community that we would represent the body of Christ that we would meet each other's needs well, that we would be what each other need in Christ. I ask these things in Jesus' name.